to Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Massapequa Park, New York. I'm Monsignor Jim Lasanti, welcoming you to celebrate with us the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let's pray together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. To better celebrate Mass, let's look into our hearts to confess our sins. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned. In my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all of the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us all to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And so we pray. Let us pray that God will keep us faithful in his loving service. Almighty God, you are our creator and our guide. May we serve you with all our hearts and know that your forgiveness rules our lives. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. He is near who upholds my right. If anyone wishes to oppose me, let us appear together. Who disputes my right? Let that man confront me. See, the Lord God is my help. Who will prove me wrong? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before the Lord in the land of the living, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice in supplication because he has inclined his ear to me the day I called. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The cords of death Compassed me, the snares of the nether world seized upon me. I fell into distress and sorrow, and I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save my life. I will walk before the Lord in the of the living. Gracious is the Lord and just. 
Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord keeps the little ones. I was brought low, and he saved me. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. For he has freed my soul from death. My eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. A reading from the letter of St. James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body What good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone might say, you have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. in the cross of our Lord, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Alleluia, alleluia. My friends, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples as they set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi, that along the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this, he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. And this is the gospel of our Lord. We have great readings today, and I, I'm grateful to you for joining us as we celebrate this Mass. On an important weekend, too, we're praying throughout all our Masses 
for the souls that were lost on 9-11 20 years ago and to pray for greater peace and an end to all terror and violence in our world. But let's get to the readings first and go first to that passage from Isaiah. God opens my ears that I may hear. It's interesting, I, I often think about what happens in the baptismal rite that you went through and I went through because there's a section where the priest or deacon will specifically bless our ears and will bless our mouth blessing our mouth in the hope that we'll use the gift of speech to build up and not to tear down, but also blessing our ears. And why do that? We do that at baptism because it's a reminder that we are called on to hear the goodness of God. Now, we think of that as happening very often in churches, to be sure. But I think most of what's really, really important in our lives, we hear first from our families, from the domestic church. And I think this passage about God blessing our ears is a reminder to all of us that if we've been baptized, part of the baptism rite was the blessing of what we would hear. The thing is, that doesn't depend on the baby, does it? It depends on those around the child who will decide what he or she hears or doesn't hear. I like to say very often to parents, if you have to fight with each other, could you do me a favor? Could you take it outside? Could you make sure you're not doing it around the kids? Why is it that we don't realize that what our children hear forms and shapes them, whether that be uh, the language that we use or the values that we espouse that might not always be the best? We're called on to be mindful that there's always someone listening, that our children are like little sponges taking in everything that we say, and they become what they hear. Stephen Sondheim, the wonderful composer of so many Broadway shows, has a show called Into the Woods, one of my favorite songs in that particular musical is called Children Will Listen, Children Will Learn. Well, they're listening all the time and they're learning. So as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as priests, as teachers, we've got to ask ourselves, when people hear us, especially young people, what values do they hear? I think for every one of us, it's good occasionally to stop and say, what goes on in my home? What kind of stuff are my children hearing? Is it positive? Is it uplifting? Is it encouraging? Or is it filled with negativity? See, if we could control what we say around our children, it would eliminate cursing, lying, swearing, gossip, negativity, prejudice, all those things that so often flow from our, our gift of speech. But there are people listening, your children, and what you say matters to them. You know, I believe that seed planted early in our lives can bear abundant fruit, but it can also bear abundant negative fruit. If what we teach them, if what they hear is the wrong stuff. Isaiah says, God bless my ears and he opened my ears so I could hear. Your job and mine is to open our ears to our children, to the positive, the loving, the kind, and the merciful. So in doing an examination of my conscience, as you probably need to do for yours, what do the people who are dearest to us hear from us? Do they hear the positive, the encouraging, and the loving? Or when they think of what we say so often, do we invite them into a world that is negative and compromised? Your job and mine is to think before we speak and be attentive to those who are listening, most especially our own children. Let's go to a second point in that first passage from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. My face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. You know, we're getting a, a precursor, if you will, of what the Lord will say in the Gospels when he says, you know, turn the other cheek. If they slap you on one side, give them the other side. Both of these passages say the same thing. We're called on not to exact revenge from those who hurt us. Now, I know it is as human as could be if somebody hurts you to want to hurt them back. I think for many of us, the idea of turning the other cheek or, or not seeking revenge is so foreign a concept. We're much more comfortable with the Old Testament line, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But our Lord calls us to a new understanding. And he says, if they hit you here, offer them this cheek. And I know that's not easy. But from Old Testament times through New Testament times, that's the command of our God. And how do we do it? I think we do it by creating a sense of empathy in our hearts for what people who are angry with us are going through and to understand someone else's anger. Good example. I've had good friends, Tom and Randy, for over 30 years. Many years ago, I did the funeral for their 19-year-old son, John, who was killed in a car accident. The driver had been drinking, and John was the victim in the car who died. But what has always stayed with me is not too long after John died, his parents sought out the young woman who had been driving. 
And I was kind of stunned by that. Like, why would you do that? And they said, because we need for her to know that she's forgiven. Now, I know that if I had a child who'd been killed by another, even in an accident, that'd be very, very hard for me to say, you're forgiven, go in peace. But that's exactly what they did. And I remember when I talked to the parents about where did they find the, the courage to forgive, they said, you know, we have other children. And when you have other children, you always presume someday they may mess up. And you hope that if they mess up, others will be as forgiving with them. In other words, they were able to forgive because they, they understood what it was to have children who make mistakes. And they realized this young lady had made a mistake. They didn't want to ruin the rest of her life by having her eat herself up with guilt. And so they offered her forgiveness. I don't know that I could have done that. I'm not sure many of us can. But it is what Tom and Randy did precisely what we're called to do if we would call ourselves followers of the Christ. Let's go to the second reading, the letter of St. James. Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well. We're told you can't just say that. It's never enough to say to people, look, I hope good things happen to you. It's not enough to wish good things on other people. We are commanded by this reading and by our Christian dignity to make sure that we're not all talk. Somebody somewhere ought to do something for the poor and the needful and the broken. We're being told in this reading that someone is you, that someone is me. Let me tell you one of the happiest things I see in my parish of Our Lady of Lourdes. I go through the office on the way out the front door, and every single week that I've been here for all these years, I see groceries on the floor that have been left behind by parishioners. They went to buy their own groceries, and then they said to themselves, our parish outreach is there to feed those who aren't able to buy their own groceries. When I buy food for my family, I'm going to buy some stuff for them too. A very casual decision, but one that I'm always struck by. Week after week, our people, people I'll never know by face or name, drop by the rectory, leave their bags of groceries because they're conscious that it's not enough to say, I hope somebody feeds the poor. I hope some family that's down on their luck have someone to care. That someone is your family and mine. That someone is you and me. And that's precisely the point of this reading. It's never enough to say somebody ought to do something. What I call the tisk, tisk, tisk syndrome. We shake our heads. We're sorry that there's sadness in the world. We're sorry that there's poverty in the world. We're sorry that there are people hurting the world. And we hope somebody somewhere does something. You want me to do it, Lord? That's precisely the point. It's not someone somewhere to do it. It's you and me. And maybe we can't save the world, but how hard can it be to stop when you're shopping in a grocery and say, wait a second, I'm going to get a can for me, but I'm going to get a can for someone else. Someone I may never know, but I know is hurting. Someone who's going through rough times. Someone who's down on their luck. I want someone to know, wherever they're hurting, that there are other people who care. I'm going to put my faith into action by not just saying, hey, we ought to do something someday down the line, somebody ought to, but that that someone is you and me, and we can't pass the buck. We're called on by this passage of St. James to actually put into action our compassion, not just to say it, but to live it by doing it. I know for me that's something I need to be reminded about. Maybe you and I this week as we go grocery shopping, and yes, I do it every week too, can be a little mindful of those who will eat because we bother to care. Not someone somewhere, but that someone somewhere is you and is me. And finally, let's go to this Gospel of Mark. Very interesting question Jesus puts to the apostles. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? Jesus is saying, I want to know what I am to you. And and I think for a lot of people, when they're asked that question, who is Jesus, will say, oh, he's God. He's the Son of God. That's all good. That's the, the catechism answer. It's right. But it's not enough. Who is he for you and me personally? I've told you before that when I do weddings, I ask the couples to write me an essay. There's a billion people out there in the world you could marry, but this is the one you chose. What is it about this unique person that makes you want to spend your life with them? And what's interesting to me is that uh, they then go into depth. Well, I have seen in her, I've seen in him, a compassion, a sensitivity, a kindness, a devotion, uh, a, a love a giving quality in them that I've never found in anyone else quite the way I found it in them. In other words, they can identify elements of personality that made them say, this is not just another boyfriend or girlfriend, this is the right person for me. Good example. 
Uh, one woman wrote recently, I was in a department store with my fiance. We had a lot of shopping to do. I turned around and he was gone. And I was so angry, like, doesn't he know we have a list of things to buy? I finally found him. He had seen an old man, he didn't know the man, but an old man with a walker. He had gone up to the man, taken the man's packages from him, walked him to the car, helped the man fold his walker, put the packages in the back seat, helped the old guy to get behind the wheel of the car. And she said, when he came back and told me the story, I thought to myself, this is exactly the man I want to marry. She said, can you imagine if he cares that much about a total stranger, if he has enough kindness in his heart to do for a total stranger, how much more would he do for me and one day, God willing, our children? And what she was saying was, I see something in this man that makes me so delighted to be one with him. In the same way, we're called on by Jesus not to give him the titles, Son of God, Messiah, Redeemer, but who is he for you personally? Is he friend? Is he companion? Is he someone you can share your whole heart with? Is he someone you know always has your back? Is he someone that you feel as intimately close to as you would a best friend? Because that's who he's supposed to be for you and me, not just some God up in the clouds, but a personal encounter with Christ means just that, that we can identify who he is as friend, as companion, as source, and as object of our love. There's one other thing in this gospel that I want to focus on. How many of us have not heard, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? You know, why is there suffering? Why do people get ill? Why do people we love pass away? Why are people sick? Why are they carrying terrible burdens? I've asked that question. I'm sure you have too. And the answer is right here in this gospel. Jesus says, you are mistaken if you think that following me is going to be easy. Instead, I tell you to take up your cross if you want to be one with me. Nobody wants to hear that, right? What does Jesus find his best buddy Peter saying in this gospel? Lord, could you keep it down? This stuff about suffering with you, people don't want to hear that. They want to hear the good stuff, the victorious stuff. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because he wants to be very clear. If our Christianity, if our Catholic Christianity is too easy, if being with him costs us nothing then we're probably not living the true faith. We're not promised that it's going to be easy. We're not promised if you be good to Jesus, it's all going to be easy road for you. Quite the opposite. He says in no uncertain terms in this gospel, you follow me, you get on that cross with me. Not an easy thing to do. But I think we mislead ourselves in believing, hey, I've been a good Catholic Christian. I should have an easy road. Quite the opposite is true. To be one with him is to be willing and able and embracing of his cross. Can you do that? Can I? Not always. But at least to recognize that part of following Christ is to accept the pain as well as the glory and to know that through the pain comes eternal glory, our great and wonderful hope. Okay, let me, if I can, offer another thought or two on the experience of 9-11. I was in Manhattan 20 years ago when the attack happened. I remember watching TV news, seeing that the first plane had hit, and deciding that uh, since I was in town, I was director at that point of an organization called the Christophers, a Catholic organization that celebrates the notion that it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness, using popular media as a way to get that message across. So I decided I was up in the West 60s that I'd go downtown and see as a priest if I could help. I went as far as I could get before the police said, Father, no one's being allowed any further down uh, downtown. Uh, there's, there's no hope for anybody being helped right now. We're just trying to save what lives we can. And then other people would say, well, you know, they're going to need blood and support over at St. Vincent's Hospital in the village. So I went over there thinking I could donate blood for those who had been hurt or wounded. But the interesting thing is when you got to St. Vincent's, there were very few people from the World Trade Center who were there. You see, most people either got out of the building or were killed. And then finally, with no place else to go, where did most of us go but to St. Patrick's Cathedral where Cardinal Egan, then the Archbishop of New York, had the wisdom to say, there's only one thing to do, and that's to pray. And so we did. I was a concelebrant at a mass that the Cardinal celebrated that day to pray for some understanding of what's at the heart of this violence, the violence that would kill thousands and thousands of innocent people. 
That night, the people at Fox News invited me to go on, and that was the question. Uh, how would God explain why this is allowed to happen? Again, don't we lay it at God's feet when men make a decision to hurt others? Why would God allow? Not God, who's the cause of 9-11. It's the choices that some people made to kill and to destroy the innocent and to raise the banner of terror. So what do we learn from this? Well, I'm going to suggest that um, something I strongly disagree with that President George W. Bush said. In an effort to calm the country and the world at that point, he said, we must keep in mind that Islam is a religion of peace. Well, he was wrong. It's not. Or at least it wasn't on 9-11. We can say, well, wait a second, Lasanti, are you picking on the Muslims? Well, when you look around the world today, most of the religious violence is performed by people who say that they're part of the Islamic faith. But in saying that, I'm mindful of the fact that at different times in human history, Catholics have been the source of the greatest violence against others in the name of their God. And Protestants have slaughtered Catholics in the same desire to stand with their God and not another. And in Myanmar today, you have Buddhists of all things who are slaughtering Muslims because their God is the better God. And the Hindus have done the same. There is no religion on earth, I can imagine, I can think of, that has not been guilty of deciding that we've got the faith, you don't, so we have the right to enact violence against others. Every time a faith embraces violence, it fails to be a faith in any way aligned to God. God is the author of life. Anyone who takes innocent human life in the name of God is blaspheming, is doing the exact opposite of what God would want us to do. And just as in every age, every religion needs to, for itself, say, this is not the way to go. I was so proud back in the 80s when there'd be some Catholics, not many, but some Catholics who would enact some violence against abortion clinics or those who ran abortion clinics. And I was so proud of our Catholic Church for saying to other Catholics, stop it. You can't be a pro-lifer and in any way compromise anyone's human life, even those who perform abortion. What I'm saying is that right now, in this particular moment in human history, it might be great if the leaders of the Islamic community would step up and be heard to say to their fellow co-religionists, this is not God's will for us to be part and parcel of terror and violence. In the same way as Catholics and Protestants and Buddhists and Hindus and people of every faith have had the need to do the same thing, to remind ourselves that to be a godly people is to be a people who affirm in every way, shape, and form the gift of human life. It is impossible to say, I'm a person of God, but I believe in the name of God, I have the right to destroy life. Every religion has made the mistake of doing just that, and every religion must be self-corrective. In this particular moment, we call on our friends in the Islamic community to say to their co-religionists, Islam is a religion of peace, and when you create violence, you violate the very tenets of what it is to be a godly person. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now with confidence in the goodness of God, let's offer our prayers of petition. The response is, Lord, hear our prayer. 
that the church will always reflect the generous love, mercy, and compassion of Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who serve in ordained ministries in the church may be living examples of Christ and inspire the faithful to transform the world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the strength to deny ourselves and put others first, to welcome strangers, to visit prisoners, and to protect unborn children, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those in our parish and family members who are ill may enjoy the consolation of the Lord and the presence of their loved ones, especially Daria Lapari, Charles Barhold, Mary Teresa Agolia, Joseph Agolia, Nancy Joyce, Marie Iannone, Jolie Bernstein, Jean Lore, Jeannie Glessing, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Nancy Brennan, Efren R. Bacani, Gloria Minutillo, Marion Gatti Corigliano, Thomas Laquadara, Jr., we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For the intention of this Mass, Dolores and Buzzy Perry, Peter Brennan, the St. Joseph Book of Remembrance, in thanksgiving of Linda, Peter Brennan, Rosie Puccio, the intention of the Lasante family, Irene Romano, Alice Zelpiksik, whom we remember at this Eucharist. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer, and let me add some intentions for those who are sick. Praying for Peter Visconti, for Bill Kirchhoff, praying for Margaret Lasanti. I pray for Doug Ahoto. We've been praying for Doug and his wife Mary, and Mary has passed this past week from life to eternal life, and we give consolation to Doug at the loss of his wife. We pray for Barbara Turley, for baby Emily Quart, for Barbara Truglio, for Edith Consiglio, Mary Littress, Veronica Tucker, Thomas Lauer. I pray for all those who are suffering from addiction of any kind. I pray as well for Michael Cataldi and Kevin Shields and George Gill, for Michael Cardone, Charlene Eisencraft, Noah Torelli and Don and Jean Azevedo. I pray for Lori Lishan, as well as Georgie Ritter, Al Clemente, Angelo Clemente, Gary Hudson, Jean Lusich Dwyer, Michael Campagna, Laura Elizabeth Steele, Patricia Colton, Anthony Posterino. I pray for Dennis Sweeney, I pray for my friend Vern, for my friend Sean McGrail, who went through serious surgery this week, for Amelia Alaka, for Rita Pizzi, for Marilyn Segulo. Let me pray for Steve Gagliardi, for Kevin Byan, for Byron DeMilo. I pray as well for John Rogers and Judy Crum, for Tommy Burke and for Mary Lou Frisbee, for Richard Ferrara, for Robert Cummings, for Brian Brown, for uh, Dorothy, who's the mom to Sheila Blanchard. I pray for Russell Castro Giovanni and Tom Crimmins. Let me pray for John and Rose Ann Simone, for baby Henry Grayson, for Loretta Sweeney, for Barbara Simone, for Dawn Spitali, for Anthony Scotto. Let me pray for Jim Harmon, for Judge Tony Falanga, for Heidi Ignoski, Van Tutwiler, Cecilia Lasanti, Jose Cruz, my friend Vita D'Amico, Leanne Lasanti, Ron Citrano, Jim Barr, Anthony Kremi, Howie Pomerantz, and Howie, happy 69th birthday, keep on being well. I pray for Jack Carroll and Nancy Lang, for Dean and Merkin McDonald and Joan Donovan, for Marilyn Arbogast and Nancy Palumbo, Pat McTaggart and Melissa Bergman. I pray for Ann Mindus and Nick Castellano, for Matthew Edwin Lewinsky, for Jorge Clemente, for Anthony Ponte, Joseph Sardone, and Emma Nicole, as well as for Kevin Boyle. I pray for Marion Barone. I pray for Millie Bolando, Marie Tenay, Marlene Keenan, Bella Glauda, Bill Franca, Ryan Terpstra, for Dennis M. Dowd, for Jennifer Murphy, Diane Pimonte, Dennis Donovan. I pray for Father Frank Nelson and John O'Brien. Let me pray for Jamie Scotto and for Carly Frigola. I pray as well for our public servants, all of our police and firefighters and EMTs, remembering especially Thomas Scanio and Connor, Connor Lasanti. Let me pray for those who are sick, for 
now before that, to finish up on those who have passed, my friends Sophia Maglione, Nicholas Delario, Bill Kelly, Catherine and William Donovan. I pray for Richard Ross Marin and Billy and Michael Sarasoli, for Michael, for Lorraine and Ray Campbell, Nicholas and Sally Cordero, my friend Corinne Locke, for John Maureen and Ann Raber, Arlene Wolfarth, Mary and Ed Raber, Chuck DeHart. I pray as well for Gail Mausch and John Slade, for Joseph Monopoly, for John and Alma Kappa, Thel Morali, John Neeson, Michael Manzella, Kenny Bolando, Christina Formato, Cynthia Prague, Carolyn Dodaro, Gaetano Sal and Angelo Emelo, Anthony Preziosi, Kevin Brown. I pray for Mary and Victor Yuli, for Pauline Romano, for Ed and June Jandibitz, for Mary and Charlie Nobile, for Linda Nobile O'Brien and Sam and Rose Pecora. I pray for Marjorie Geary, as well as for Anne Marie Tenay, Billy Taylor, Monica Kerrison, for Regina Robinson and Robbie Purick. I pray as well for Jim Purick, who's also passed recently, for Jimmy Saldo, for Joan and John Donnelly. I pray for Richard Jackal and Henry Meyer, Colin and Tommy Ryan, Barry Champney, Eleanor Mazzi, Monsignor Jack Alessandro, Brian Hussey, Suzanne Scanio, Mary Rose and John Brosnan, Leon Sherman Jr., Ronald Chiapo, Kate Kelly, Marie Sicolo, Norbert Bobby Gomez and Connie and Sal Cusimano, for Ted Scorcia, for Monsignor Tom Spadaro, for Vincent Castoria Jr. and Jerry Monk, for Dave Robin, Thomas O'Shea, for Matthew Toriello, for Marie Austin, for Vita Palmieri, Emily LaFaso. I pray as well for Kathleen Smith, for John Arturi, for Raymond Kennedy, for Connor and Will Robles. I pray for the 13 Marines who were lost trying to rescue those at the Afghanistan airport in Kabul. I pray for Marianne Hayes. I pray as well for Tracy Wachowski, Louis, Luigi Conti, Dale Louise Odom, Elmer Schantz, Joe and Marion Bacigalupo, Alex Haliasas, Pat Sistar, Peggy Barr, Marvin Klein, Jerry and Edward Casal, for John McMacken and Raymond Hussey. I pray for Judge Don Belfi, Tino DiBello, uh, Nicholas Lasanti, Father Joe Lukaszewski, Father Ken Marks, Joe and John Largan. I pray for Ed Almer and Father Tim Hurton, for Paul Stashut and all the Stashut family who have passed from this life to the next. For Gary and Mike Scorcia, Marilyn Salonia, Nick Martone, Constance Polio, Captain Tim Murray, Jerry and Michael Pangala, Norma Calabrese, Dottie Lauer, John Glauda, Joseph Lovett, Marie Casavecchi, Carolyn Duval, Bob and Pat Caliban, Niscotti and Nina Passarelli, Scott Pollock, Joe and Peggy Bauman, Tom Sully O'Sullivan, Peter Gannon, Margaret and Katie O'Connor. I pray for young Ben Julik. I pray too for Tommy Engelhart. I want to pray too for uh, Victor and Lillian, Bobby and Marge, Tom and Helen, Barlow and Ethel. I pray for Mary Ahoda, who I mentioned past uh, recently as well. For Edward Riker, for Danny Carlson, Luke Johnson. Uh, I pray for Evelyn Lalicki, for PJ O'Rourke, Frank Kilgannon, Robert and Joan Cook, Anna Gomes, Paul Struzzieri, Anna and Peter Canal. Uh, Leonardo Playa, Donato Forlenza, Aniello Ferrara, Marie Hoyecki, John Bolando Sr., Marion Harrington. I pray for Marie Gail Penny, as well as Michael A. Diorio, Captain John Robert Minatoli, Louise McNeil, Lena Lasanti, Mary Uli. I pray for Genevieve Lourdes Minatoli, for Virginia Dennard. I pray too for uh, Christopher Laybourne, for Richard Fasano. I pray for Adina Placido, for Helen Kidash. I pray for Marlene, pardon me, Madeline Alari, my good friend Madeline, for Anna Malandro, for James Zidi, uh, and I, for Tracy Timothy Terpstra. I want to pray too for uh, uh, all of those who are struggling with COVID, all those who have died because of COVID, and for the doctors and nurses who serve them. I'm sending a special message of prayer and love for Jack Carroll who's over in Sloan Kettering, and for his continued uh, well-being. We need you, Jack. Please cooperate with the doctors and get well. I pray for all of those who are still in the grips of terror around the world, and for a change of heart and mind, that all of us might know that to be children of God is to respect all children of God and to treasure all human life. And having now gone through all these intentions, let's join together in offering a prayer we say to the Mother of God, that Mary, Queen of Peace, might bring peace to our needful world. 
In her name we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed, Blessed be God, God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Lord, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from all of my sin. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice will be found acceptable to God, our Heavenly Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands to the praise and the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and receive our gifts. And may the worship of each one of us here bring salvation to all. And we ask you to grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father all-powerful and ever-living God, we praise and thank you through your Son, Jesus our Lord, for your presence and your action in our needful world. In the midst of conflict and division, we know it is you who turn our minds to thoughts of peace. Your spirit changes our hearts. Enemies begin to speak with one another. Those who are parted join hands in friendship. Nations, once at war, seek the way of peace together. Your spirit is at work when understanding puts an end to strife, when hatred is quenched by mercy, when vengeance gives way to love and forgiveness. For this, we should never cease to thank and praise you. So we join now with all the choirs of heaven as they sing forever to your glory. God of power and might, we praise you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who comes in your name. He is the word that brings salvation. He is the hand you stretch out to us who are sinners. He is the way that leads to your peace. God, our Heavenly Father, we've often wandered far from you, but through your Son, Jesus, you brought us back. You gave him up to death so that we might turn again to you and find our way in love to one another. Therefore, we celebrate today the love and reconciliation Christ has gained for us. And we ask you, Father, to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. While he was at supper on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread in his sacred hands and gave you, Father, thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, Jesus took a chalice filled with the fruit of the vine. Again, Father, he thanked you for your goodness, gave the chalice to his disciples and friends and said, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, 
which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Son has entrusted to us this pledge of his love. We celebrate the memory of his death and resurrection, and we bring you the gift you've given to us, this sacrifice of love and reconciliation. Therefore, we ask you, Father, to accept us together with your Son. Fill us with his Spirit through our sharing in this meal, and may he take away all that divides us. May this same Spirit of love keep us in communion of mind and heart with Francis, our Pope, John, our bishop, along with all the bishops, the clergy, the religious, and all of God's people. Father, make your church throughout the world a sign of unity and an instrument of your peace. You've gathered us here today around the table of your son in fellowship with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with her devoted spouse, Saint Joseph, and all the saints. In that new world, where the fullness of your peace will be revealed, Gather people of every race, every language, every way of life to share in the one eternal banquet with Jesus Christ, who is our risen and our loving Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Somebody somewhere ought to do something is the credo of too many of us. The command of the scripture today is that you're the person, as am I, who's supposed to do the good that will change our world. For the ability to move from sadness at the state of the world to activists who work to change the world for the good, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all anxiety, as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you my peace, my peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. With your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your 
Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. My friends, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us all to share in everlasting life. Amen. spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Just a, a couple of announcements. If you happen to live locally, I know that Melissa and Matt, our music directors, are looking for new members of the choir and people to be involved in music ministry. If you're interested, please call the rectory, 516-541-3270. And also to mention that we're getting active again, thanks to our moderator, Father Kevin, with RCIA. So if you are, or you know an adult, who thinks they might be interested in the Catholic faith, again, Leave a message at the rectory for Father Kevin, and it will be followed up, and we'll be glad to have you as part of the program. I wanted to also mention that uh, uh, we encourage everyone who can to please think about coming back to church. We encourage those uh, who have not been vaccinated to be open to that possibility, encouraged by our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Um, I just want to also thank so many of you who have continued throughout the over one year that we've been doing this online Mass to give us your support. Uh, especially financially, it matters a lot. You've made a big difference in our lives. If you haven't yet gotten around to doing that, please think about helping us out with Our Lady of Lourdes. And to those of you who send me messages saying, please, if you can, keep the Mass online, we're going to do that. Uh, but with your help, we can do it. So please, if you can, give us your support. Also to mention, as I always do, uh, please watch on your computer this week uh, the Personally Speaking Show, Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Santi on YouTube. This week's guest is a terrific guy, Stephen Matz. Now, if you were a New Yorker, you'd know he was a great pitcher with the New York Mets. Now he's working for the Toronto Blue Jays. But what a guy, amazing guy, good family man who loves Jesus and loves to talk about his faith. So he's our guest. And next week, it's uh, uh, Tamira Mensa Stock. And Tamira is the wonderful athlete who won the gold medal in women's wrestling at the Tokyo Olympics. And you'll remember her because her picture was everywhere as she, after winning the gold medal, embraced and surrounded herself with the American flag and just said, I'm so proud to represent our country. Uh, a great Christian and a great American, uh, Tamira will be my guest next week. So, uh, And then uh, there's a great newly ordained priest the following week. Uh, Father Michael, who's going to be our guest, and I encourage you to watch that program as well. We're Dane, like two months only, and what a beautiful soul he is. And you, you, I ask the obvious question, why would anyone in modern-day America uh, choose to become a priest? And he has some good answers. So, uh, Father Michael Masella, please watch him as well. Uh, just tune in when you can. Personally speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti on YouTube, as well as being on the Catholic Channel on Sirius XM. Let's pray. Lord and God, may the Eucharist that we have shared in spirit and in fact influence all our thoughts and actions, and may your spirit guide and direct all our ways on earth, and we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. 
Amen. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you and your families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. How beautiful for spacious skies, for amber.